Thank you for joining us for another opportunity of fellowship with This Is My Story, Testimonies That Move the Soul. Well, this afternoon, we have guests that are joining us actually right here in our home. One is a young man who's currently a student at one of our academies, La Sierra Academy, and he is a junior this year fine gentleman that I've been watching now for about three years or so, and he aspires one day to be a minister. He enjoys ministry, he's inspired by the word, and he has something that he'd like to share in regards to ministry. However, it is behind the mask and what his interpretation is of COVID-19 now that we want to be mindful of. And so we will, we will be welcoming McGill. And I'm going to just say McGill because the last name is a tongue twister and you got to learn how to roll those R's just right. So I'm going to let him tell you the R. And then we are going to be welcoming someone that you all know quite well. You've heard about him. You've seen about him. Maybe you've seen the little swagger that he got going on. But today I have the privilege of introducing him in a professional manner. That would be, boy, I tell you, Chief Warrant Officer. Four. Chief Warrant Officer. Four. See, I got corrected. Chief Warrant Officer Four, uh, Frank Benjamin. All of them have a story about a mask. So first we're going to hear, I believe, we're going to hear from McGill first. And then we're going to tackle some pictures about a mask and then we're going to follow up with Elder Benjamin. Stay tuned. Hold on to your seats. You're not going to believe what you hear coming. Let's go ahead and tackle McGill first. McGill, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you feel about all that's taking place with COVID and your take on what's happening really with this thing called COVID-19 and the mask. It's going to take about five minutes or so, and then they'll share that. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Miguel Ojeda, and uh, I'm a junior at La Sierra Academy. Um, when Ms. Debbie first asked me to come up and speak about my experience with COVID-19, uh, there was definitely a few ideas that rattled inside my brain. Um, so I'm actually going to start with the personal experience that I had. Um, COVID-19 hit in just about the second half of my freshman year. And um, seeing that high school was just such a new and scary thing for a lot of us, um, none of us had in our mind that we would ever, ever experience a pandemic, right? Um, we've studied in history classes, you know, things like Spanish flu and influenza, and uh, we've seen these things as events that have happened in the past and don't apply it to us anymore because of uh, whatever it be, technology, medicine, personal care. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that it did happen, and I don't think that anybody could have predicted it. Um, it's something that didn't discriminate between young and old, didn't discriminate between race, gender, or uh, monetary lines. Um, it was something that hit hard for everybody. And so I think it's easy to relate experiences with that. And it's also something that's very unifying between all of us. Um, and I'm here to speak to you today about what happened to me specifically. Um, so I can remember uh, very vividly the day that we got told that we would all be going home because of the pandemic. And uh, it was more of a buildup than a sudden event. So for weeks, um, we had heard that there was this virus going around and that it started in China and nobody knew the origin. And it was a scary thing um, because it wasn't the only event that was going on at that time. We had um, our tensions with other countries like North Korea and we were, and we were worried about going into um, another economic crisis. Uh, so not only were we stressed out, uh, I personally as a freshman because of the scary new thing called high school, uh, but also I was stressed out because of the events that were happening outside of this, what was happening in the world. Um, so the day we got sent home, uh, some of us were relieved because that meant that we didn't have to dress up in uniform and you know spend six, seven hours at school and some of us uh, were worried. So following that event, uh, the first day we all logged into Zoom, much like uh, all of you are right now, uh, we were confused, we were fumbling, we were all over the place, and uh, it was just overall confusing. Um, but what ended up transpiring over the next year and a half, 
for me personally, was a blur because someone my age, um, and I think I speak for a lot of people when I say this, um, had trouble just accepting what the situation was because it was something that none of us had ever experienced before. Um, us being quarantined, our national government saying, hey, you guys need to hunker down in your homes and make sure you have this, this, and that. Um, it was scary. So going outside and seeing everybody wear masks and you know having to worry about staying six feet apart, uh, it was a scary experience. And that's, that's a feeling that's completely validated. Um, and on top of that, you know, a lot of negative thoughts and emotions that come with isolation um, is something that's very common, right? Because we were created to be social beings. And the moment that we're prohibited to have that interaction between each other, and um, it's, it's just difficult for people because none of us really expect it, nor do we know how to handle it all that well. Um, and although we have some people that prefer to be alone, it's hard to be alone all the time. Um, you know, in terms of my interpretation of the event, and for everybody else for that matter, it was definitely a learning experience. We all learned something about ourselves, about, about others. Um, and one thing that I learned specifically was to appreciate the company of others because um, whether that be through the passing of some people, unfortunately, um, had their time cut short by uh, nobody's fault and by not being able or being restricted to being certain people, right? So my grandfather actually passed away from COVID-19. And uh, it was a shock to me because he was a healthy man. He was approaching 68 and he ran almost every single day. He used to trot around work, he would tell me. Um, and he worked at a, a piping factory just down the street. And if I had to guess, he would probably be the last person um, to ever pass away from COVID-19. So when he did it, it was a bit of a shock um, because reality of the situation set in that I wouldn't be able to see him anymore. And it wasn't temporary like uh, my friends or my teachers or other classmates. It was something very permanent. Um, so along those lines, you know, and not a day goes by where I don't think I remember him. Uh, I appreciate him a lot more. And that's a sentiment that's shared by people who are reunited, fortunately, thank God, today with their families and their friends. But it's a learning experience for those who have lost people. And uh, this can't be summed up as anything else but a tragedy. But if I had to say one thing, it would be to maintain hope because although we're slowly going back to normality, um, this event isn't something that's just gonna be blotted out. This, this is history. Um, and I've had this conversation frequently with my friends and teachers. You know, We've lived through his, a very important historical event, the first pandemic in the 21st century, right? And it's not anything that anyone can just brush off. Um, it's a major event that we're going to remember for the rest of our lives. The, the, the event we're going to be telling our grandchildren about, the event that'll be, um, I would assume, in history books. And so the unique aspect of it is, although it was tragic, we all learned something. And I had to be grateful for one thing other than my life. Uh, I would be grateful for the lesson that it taught me about dating others and the fact that our time here is very limited. Um, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. McGill did a fine job, this young man who aspires to be a minister one day. And as you can hear, he can articulate quite well. We're going to hear more from him when we start our panel. But now let's continue. As I mentioned, someone we've seen on the, the backside of things is now coming to the forefront. I've already introduced him, Chief Warrant Officer, Frank Benjamin, Chief Warrant Officer of the Fall. And so let's hear from him, his spin on Behind the Mask. Hmm. Good evening, everyone. Let me get from Behind the Mask. And yes, for quite a while I've been in the back taking care of business as far as uh, this program goes. Uh, today I get to sit in front of the camera. Now this whole COVID-19 bit, uh, I remember Miguel said it was um, almost what, two years, something now that 
when the COVID hit and folks started getting infected and sick and etc. And uh, I remember when the I got the news of the epicenter being established in um, Coachella Valley from a worship service. Uh, two churches there and and uh, the AO was designated two weeks after they, they met for services, that that was the epicenter of the pandemic. And I, re I was moved to, at the point in time, Imani was up and rolling. And I was moved to, I spoke with the VP and he said, it's your call, Brother Ben. So um, I made the choice to virtual services and that's what we started doing that's what we did now as i learned about and you know began to understand about what this covid 19 is um the information that i received came from all over the place and everything was very negative. One of the things that really confused me um, was that I didn't understand it. I honestly didn't understand it. One thing I knew though, was that I came to the conclusion that this was not, um, as they stated, a situation where the, um, what was it, the monkey and the, the snake and the whatever it is came together. But man, look, I thought about that and I realized, no, that, that couldn't be. I spent eight years in the Orient, living in Japan specifically, eight years. And, and I'm very well acquainted, I should say, with their customs, etc. They eat a lot of strange things. Yes, and all the years they have done that, this combination never happened. It, it seemed very, very strange to me that this was natural. And the more that I've learned about it, the more I believe my thinking that this was man-made, so to speak. And um, this COVID, um, this virus has been around a long time, I learned. And we've been taking the flu shots and whatnot. It's a flu virus. But what we're dealing with here is the same virus, as they would say, on steroids. It distressed me, it, it puzzled me. And uh, then they came up with the vaccine. And my understanding of the vaccine was not a good one. I had a lot of information but from all over the places, all over the place, from individuals claimed to be experts, individuals, medical personnel, et cetera, et cetera. But it still bothered me. Something, something in my mind didn't register that the vaccine and the whole nine yards was on the up and up, and it, it bothered me. So all this time, I refused to take the vaccine. I said, no, where there is smoke, there must be fire. I refused to take the vaccine for those basic reasons. I didn't understand. And then to make a long story short, um, I heard a young man, Dr. Ramon, um, I don't remember his last name, but he is a uh, PhD immunologist, young man from Bermuda. Uh, he explained what the vaccine is. He explained what the virus is. He explained how it works. When he was finished discussing, it made a lot of things made sense. 
and a lot of answers I received. And it changed my perspective on the whole nine yards. In fact, the day before, family members, sisters, brothers, and folk been on my case all this time for taking the back to take the vaccine and water. And I just bluntly, I listened and smiled, and I went my way. <laughs> and then um, it, I think it was about a day or two before I um, heard Dr. Ramon speak. I stopped and I said, Lord, I never, I asked for information, but I didn't ask for direction. I said, Lord, please tell me what to do. Honestly, tell me what to do. And then I heard Dr. Ramon. My questions were answered, etc. My questions were answered and whatnot, etc. And I was able to make an educated choice, an educated decision, not built on suppositions or whatnot, because I understood what was happening with both the vaccine and the virus. And I was able to make a an educated decision. And yes, about two weeks now, I had the first Pfizer vaccine. And um, no, the, the, about two weeks ago, I had second Pfizer vaccine. And I had one about uh, three weeks before. So that's my story concerning this um, COVID-19 and this uh, epidemic situation. Very, so sorry. Very interesting in terms of one of our own educated, seasoned, experienced traveler. And now we're gonna hear from a third individual. It may not necessarily be his views, but representing the views of an individual who's actually here right in front of me, but is a little bit camera shot. And I've asked him to share her perspective on COVID-19. So not necessarily his views, but he'll be speaking on her behalf. So we now welcome Chief Jerry, retired Chief Jerry up. Behind the mask. Good evening, everyone. Certainly a pleasure to be here today. I think one of the things that we all must be thankful for, and that is we are still breathing and being able to enjoy another day, a day that we've never seen before. Well, my views in regards to COVID-19 may vary. Her views, according to um, the moderator, as in regards to COVID-19, um, let me just say this. I can only think about how it affected me. I remember uh, when I was a very young boy, well, maybe really, around three years old, and I had pneumonia. And I had it four times. And the thing that was very interesting about my story was the fact that the doctor had told my mother that if I had pneumonia again, that I would not make it. I'd end up getting pneumonia. And the thing that was interesting was COVID attacked the respiratory system. From what I understand, people end up catching pneumonia and that becomes part of the illness. Now, the thing that was very interesting for me was the fact that with prayer, and I truly am 
believing that you know that it was prayer that brought me through this. So I am really a proponent of getting vaccinated versus not getting vaccinated. Now, the other point of view that I want to bring is that I, I come from a leadership background. And uh, one of the things that we have to recognize is that, you know, this, this virus is very, very serious. I think that we need to make sure that we recognize the seriousness of it. But from a professional standpoint, medical standpoint, there, there may be those in the medical field that have, they have a lot of knowledge about this virus we don't have as lay people. And because of that, you know, they may know things that we don't know. And because of that, that may be some reasons why many of them are hesitant in taking the, the vaccine. Uh, that's one, one side of it. And also the other side is there have been people who have taken the vaccine, who also have gotten sick and who have died from COVID. So uh, I guess the question that you must ask yourself is that the benefits certainly outweighs the, the results of not having the vaccine. So that's basically what, um, that's one of the things that I have to contend with when I think about should we or should we not? I, I'll, I will say one thing and I'll uh, wrap this up. But as a, um, as a firefighter personnel, one that dealt with uh, medical aids, emergencies, rescues, I recall a situation that happened not to me, but to one of my coworkers when AIDS was a big issue. And one of the things that happened with one of my paramedics was the fact that she had gotten stuck with a needle that they had used on an AIDS patient. Well, when that happened, we were all very concerned, highly concerned. And she had to go through six months of testing. And thank God it ended up that she did not contract the AIDS virus from the needle stick that she had experienced. Now, one of the things that, um, is really interesting about that is when you look at that, it did not happen to her, but there have been cases where it has happened to other people. And so I look at this, I look at it as, you know, we have to be thankful for being able to just get through this and survive. And we don't know, um, we don't know who may be carrying the virus, who may not be carrying it. But I think it is up to us to make sure that we do everything in our power to shield ourselves so that we do not become victims of this disease ourselves. So with that, I just want to say that everything in life, God has given us a choice. And if you make that choice as to getting vaccinated versus not getting vaccinated, that is your choice, and you have the right to make that choice. So with that said, I hope that we keep praying, keep believing that we can beat this pandemic from education that the scientists, the doctors, the nurses, they all are putting their two cents in to try and figure out how we can beat this so that we can move on. I heard earlier that this is a time in history it is time in history that we will never, ever forget. And we need to make sure that we survive this, and keep God first at all times. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. And so we continue our discussion. And, and while we didn't hear from the professional, I'm going to invite her son now. And this will be our fourth perspective before we entertain some specific uh, questions that are germane. And while he's coming forward, I want to make mention of something. My cousin's dad, unfortunately, Mr. Fountain, was not vaccinated on 
uh, in terms of his health and whatnot, he had made the decision not to. My cousin Sharon, as I understand, was fully vaccinated and in fact had been vaccinated quite early. And as you know, some of you know, she was a teacher. She had been an administrator, a retired uh, superintendent of schools for South Central Conference there in the South. And uh, she certainly served her time and she had a love of education and working with students. In fact, she was working with students at the time that we were last there and we last saw her. And so I wanted to share some of this information, but right now we're gonna welcome Miguel to come back and tell his mom's story. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, so thank you once again. Yeah, so uh, thank you once again. A little bit of audio too. Uh, that's the difficulty of these meetings. I uh, experienced it firsthand going to Zoom for a year and a half. A lot of that, trust me. Uh, but I was asked to share the experience of a medical professional. And uh, although obviously I myself are, are not a medical professional, I can definitely speak to uh, what I saw and uh, what I've heard from my own mother, who was uh, an LVN, worked through the height of the pandemic, uh, her experiences. And um, the importance of hearing these views, I think, is uh, invaluable because there's a difference between experiencing it firsthand, someone who's uh, quite literally come face to face with a virus that has wreaked so much havoc on the lives of ourselves and others. Um, and one of the things I can remember very specifically was uh, my mother coming home, uh, the way that she looked, the way that she acted, uh, the pandemic just burned her out from day one. Um, and some of the things that I heard were surprising. Uh, I can remember her coming home. We had set up a sanitation station um, for her to get ready in so she could come see us, hug us and to greet us and to be with us. Um, while she was at work, she literally had to take alcohol baths um, to make sure that she wasn't exposing us to anything. Um, and then the effects of it all were just incredible, right? No one, um, was quite sure what to do. So one of the many experiences that I've heard from my mother in our long talks on uh, her experiences working during the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, the work that she had done was difficult and not because of the volume, well, because of the volume, but because of uh, the environment as well. So for those of you who don't know, PPE, personal protective equipment, um, goes further than just a mask for healthcare professionals and those especially uh, dealing with a dangerous situation like a pandemic. Um, they have to wear specialized masks, N95s, which are particulates. Um, they completely seal off uh, airways, uh, not so much that you can't breathe, um, but they restrict any particles coming in or out. And um, one of the stories she told me actually is to check this PPE to make sure that the nurses and medical personnel were completely safe from this virus. Um, they would actually put them, uh, and I don't remember the specific name, but the best that I can approximate this to is kind of like putting a fishbowl over your head uh, while you have this mask on, and they spray this very bitter substance in it. And the way you check your seals, or they actually have you check your seal by uh, closing down on the nose piece. As you can see on some of these masks, there's this metal strip that goes across and you close it to make sure that uh, your nose and mouth is completely covered. Um, it's the same thing for N95s, except it's uh, it's full seal. Uh, so they spray this very bitter substance in and it's aerosolized. So uh, that means that it travels through the air and uh, you get a very, very rude reminder if you do not put your N95 on because uh, I've heard from her that it's not a pleasant bitterness like coffee or anything that you're used to. It is extremely bad, like um, almost nauseating. Um, but on top of that, that was just a preparation that she had gone through in just one of the steps. Um, PPE also extends to not just masks, but face shields and gowns and um, gloves, other protective equipment, and the list goes on and on. But 
in terms of the environment. Imagine having all this song when it's 95 plus outside, testing hundreds of people in cars. And those people are upset and they're irritated because it's hot and they've been waiting in a line. And it's a lot of stress on the healthcare work. Um, and I can speak to this firsthand because when she used to come home, there'd be bags under her eyes and she'd be hunched over carrying her bag. It's completely burnt out from this work that she was doing. And um, just the experience overall for her was not pleasant. Um, but she did it in service of others. And on top of that, uh, her coworkers too were experiencing the same thing. And um, further down the line, in terms of the pandemic timeline, uh, you know, we faced supply shortages. So uh, eventually from wearing PPE, which were changed out every single time you saw a new patient, uh, they were supplied with lab coats. And uh, at one point, you know, they were running out of PPE. And uh, even further down the line, there were strikes from nurses because they couldn't get the proper equipment to be completely safe or as safe as they could have been. Um, and overall, it was just a tough experience for every healthcare worker. And that's, that's speaking from the experience that an LVN had working at a testing ground. Um, that's not to speak at those who work in hospitals, intensive care units, uh, clinics, um, the list goes on. Um, but it's important to note that um, although this pandemic wreaked havoc on us collectively uh, as non-medical uh, non professional, we have to keep in mind that still to this day, as, as we're returning to normalcy, as we're getting vaccinated and the restrictions are relaxing for us, it has not slowed down one bit for the medical professionals. It is, it is rushed on and on and on, and they're facing sleepless nights, countless hours. And um, although things are slowly improving for us, we have a, we have a certain responsibility and uh, we have a certain level of thankfulness that we should have for our medical providers um, and the opinions and the facts that they hold, although may be different from ours, uh, whether that's pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, whether that's uh, otherwise, uh, I think there is just something we can agree on and that is that we should respect our medical professionals and be thankful that, uh, that they're putting their lives on the line for us. Uh, I believe personally that being a medical professional is a very, very unselfish career choice and uh, is definitely in service of others. Uh, so in that sense, we should be like-minded. And so now we've heard from four different perspectives and I'm gonna invite Elder Benjamin to come back. And I have some questions as you may have, and I'm gonna open up a couple of other things in terms of discussion. And then the video that Elder Benjamin was speaking of that he saw, We'll share that at the end for those who would like to stay, stay by. What I'd like to know, gentlemen, as you have shared, not just your, your mom, but your own personal experiences, what have you found to be the most challenging bit of information to accept in your respective roles? And by that, I perhaps mean uh, what was the most difficult thing for you to conform to as you saw the adjustments taking place in your life. And Miguel, we'll start with you as a student at La Sierra, a young man who's as a teenager who's in the church and then at school and then you have your other responsibilities in the home. Uh, what was one of the most challenging things that you uh, found to work with as the atmosphere begin to change. Right, so I think one of the most difficult aspects of it was that isolation would be perpetual for as, as long as we knew at that point. Uh, meaning that earlier on in the pandemic, we weren't certain how long quarantine was going to be. We never got an end date in those beginning months. And so at first, while I was glad to be home and be 10 feet away from the fridge, um, it slowly set in that the reality was um, that I'd be living like this for a while. And that social events were no longer going to be a thing. Going to school was no longer going to be a thing. And uh, like I said earlier, I expressed my opinion that um, you really do start to miss those things. Because although I was one to just, you know, kind of sleep in and uh, get every chance I can to be lazy, uh, I was overwhelmed by the fact that all I knew was the four walls of my bedroom for a little while. And uh, I did gain a new appreciation for being able to go outside the house. Well said. Elder Benjamin. Same question for you. Well, there were pros and cons for me. Um, I enjoyed 
being home and not having to uh, travel different places to and fro, et cetera. Uh, at the price of gas, um, no, I appreciate it being in one spot. But um, I am a people person. I miss that. One of the things that got my attention, undivided attention, was the number of individuals that I knew that began to die from this COVID. I mean, it got my undivided attention and the realization, no, this is reality and this thing really is dangerous. That basically is what got my attention. Gentlemen, what have you lost from this pandemic? Anything that you have lost, either of you, Elder Benjamin? Well, the freedom to really go when, where, and I, I please or like, and uh, you know, I'm an individual that, you know, brother, sister, friend, acquaintance, I mean, even a stranger. Call me at the drop of a hat. Hey, you, if I um, can help, I'm gone. You know, I love to travel. I love to travel. I haven't been able to do that. Um, it has drastically limited my abilities to move or go places, even locally. Because, um, you know, you, you never know um, when or where, like I said earlier, you know, um, Coachella Valley was designated as the epicenter. And that came about after a worship service, a worship service. So I said to myself, you know what? I think it would be wise for you to keep your little dark self quietly in one place, you know, as much as possible. And that's what I did. So freedom of movement, I would say, you know. I miss. Understood, Miguel. Mm. Yeah, I can. I can definitely attest to uh, losing family members and losing freedom of movement, as uh, Elder Benjamin said. I think, in light of having a hopeful tone, I think one of the things I had lost uh, was the loss of fear of having to uh, have a certain level of, let's say, uh, social interaction. And what I mean by that is that. Um, because I had been away from people for so long, and this is a common theme that you'll find among people who have been in isolation, which is all of us, um, I've lost the fear of having to uh, be timid, meaning that, you know, when I, when I get back to school, and when I'm with my friends, and I'm with my family, um, we've all felt that kind, of, that kind of intimidation when it comes to talking to new people, and um, although we've been doing it for about a year and a half, year and three quarters now through a screen, um, it doesn't compare it to speaking to someone face to face. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing about that is uh, previously, uh, I was having this wonderful conversation with Elder Benjamin over lunch. And um, one of the thoughts that came across in my mind is, you can't get this kind of interaction through a screen. The ideas that we shared and the conversation that we had, the way I was able to read his tone, the things that I learned from him, I could have never gotten through a screen. And while that doesn't invalidate being able to communicate through a screen, um, it does speak to how much of an impact it does have. Um, so in that sense, uh, I've gained something out of loss, if that makes sense. Amen. It's interesting if you said gain, because as I sat here listening to you both, I was pondering, if there's anything that you gained, what would it have been? Or what is it? If you gained anything, if you gleaned anything that has inspired you during this time of pandemic. Yeah, um, one thing I I've been able to do is um, one of my favorite hobbies, that's read, research. I I've been able to do some writing. Um, most folks know me, but they don't know me as a writer or one of those creative individuals uh, that way. But I've been able to do some of that. I've been able to do some painting, you know, I've been able to uh, uh, do some things that I haven't done for a number of years, uh, things that I enjoy doing. 
but mostly reading, reading and researching and writing men. And I have learned a tremendous amount of things. And uh, you know, I'm really, I'm really um, happy, satisfied, uh, you know, with that. So it, it, it hasn't been all a loss, but you know, as an individual, me, uh, whenever I'm throwing a lemon, you know, I look for some water to make some lemonade. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make me some lemonade, drink and cheer. So that, that's my perspective. Very good. Very good. Miguel, you mentioned about something that you've gained. But in addition to that, gentlemen, uh, can I ask you, how has the political atmosphere affected you during this time of uh, pandemic? Has it dissuaded you? Has it encouraged you? Has it impacted your decision making in any way in terms of the path that you've been following now for about a year and a half? Right. So I think actually uh, one of my main gripes with the uh, political takes is medicine should not be politicized and medicine is not political in nature. So seeing, you know, things, for example, the vaccine or masks um, being politicized to me it seems something that's very dangerous because um, wearing the mask is not a selfless action. So the mask that I'm wearing right now does not prevent me from breathing in bacteria necessarily, reduces um, the chance that I'm exposed to it. But the purpose of the mask is to keep the air from my mouth going out and potentially infecting other people. And for example, the vaccine even, the vaccine, the job of the vaccine is to give your body uh, an idea of what it's up against. Um, and seeing, you know, for example, uh, this getting politicized is, is not a healthy idea because um, politics has to do with humans and the, and the direction we want to take society. Medicine is for the benefit and, and perpetualization of people. And so mixing po uh, pol politics and medicine is just not a good recipe. I would agree. And the politics uh, that you've experienced. Do you think, do you think it brought about any unity in terms of any discussions with the pandemic? Right. I think if there's any one point of unity, it was discussion about the pandemic. And one of the things that we frequently run into when it comes to hard times is silence, because it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about sometimes. Um, talking about the loss of loved ones, talking about um, our personal experiences, these are all things that we have to be vulnerable about. And I think if any sense of unity has come through this as a whole, I think it's the ability to share our experience. Well said. Elder Benjamin. One of the things that um, I realize um, is that politics as practice is not so much about people other than the power to control the people. The actual care and compassion of the people was not expressed. Like um, like, like, like my, you know, I mean, my grandmama used to say, you know, um, common sense isn't common, everybody don't have it. I didn't see a lot of common sense being practiced or demonstrated in the politicking that was going on. You know, I mean, decisions were being made and I'm saying, see, all that is what kind of disturbed me and confused me about the whole vaccine and the virus. I mean, they were, as Miguel said, this is not medicine, is not something you, you, you politicize. It's a right, it should be a right to every human being. I appreciate what you're saying. Let me go a step further with you, Elder Benjamin. Do you believe that the reaction of the church has been correct? Do you think that we can worship now comfortably according to the requirements that have been given? The temperature check and allowing social distancing, which I recognize we're not doing now. Please understand, I know that. That's why they're masked and I'm talking. <laughs> but. Your thoughts on that? Have we handled it correctly? According to the rules and regulations, churches are uh, opening, operating, 
um, doing the social distancing and etc. Et yes, according to the rules and regulations, yes, they have. Me personally, I am still enjoying the um, ability and the privilege to um, do virtual worship. For instance, this morning, today, I worship with um, a church in Chicago. And then I worship with a church with um, uh, Oakwood University. You see, um, I, I had two services with Oakwood and the one in Chicago. Then I had my own private devotion. No, I'm having a, I'm having a blast, you know, from that perspective. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I'm able to still visit and enjoy. But again, in answer to your question, technically, yes, they are. But me personally, like I said, uh, this 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 young fellow um, uh, kind of prefers to uh, just wait a little longer because you know where this COVID is concerned, oops, is not acceptable. So you have new membership at Bedside Baptist. Amen. That's what you're now looking at, Bedside Baptist. Amen. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Your thoughts on church and worship experience? How have you been impacted? And uh, are you worshiping publicly now? Right. So, while I agree with Elder Benjamin, one of the great things about worshiping virtually is that I can wake up about five minutes before service, be able to throw on one of these shirts, and eat breakfast while I'm there. Um, and while that's all in good, uh, in terms of you know the physical measures that we've taken to worship in person now. Uh, I think the church, the Adventist church, and specifically my church in Corona, have done a wonderful job. We've been able to employ medical staff like my mother. Uh, she's been there servicing, uh, working temperature gauges and all that. And uh, I think the response overall in terms of putting in measures to make sure that people are safe and healthy to worship is great. I think one of the greatest aspects of it, and uh, frankly, we did this rarely but i think it's something we should practice more going forward is having outdoor worship because outdoor worship is just so much different and although you know we may not have the great acoustics of being inside the chapel and uh, being able to hear everyone and sit down uh, i think from the few services that i've gone to being outside is is a complete game changer can, can, I, can I say one more thing sure. don't get me wrong folks i miss terribly one-on-one, -on -one. but when I weigh the pros and cons, wisdom says, again, stay under the radar. Because like I said earlier, you know, oops, is not acceptable, <laughs> not acceptable. I am not afraid to die. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in God's word have I read that it says that at any point I should volunteer. I'm just saying. Sure. It makes a lot of sense. One of the reasons why I was interested in having this discussion and tackling behind the mask was also to entertain a, another consideration of COVID. You all alluded to it in terms of your remarks. It's no coincidence that we're discussing this now in this form in part because of COVID. And so behind the mask also leads to another inference in terms of our Christian experience. We as members may know of individuals or we ourselves who hide behind masks each week in our homes, in our communities, in our church. There's pain there. There's hurt. There's disappointment. There's the dissatisfaction of decisions that are being made. And then there's also the unspoken issues. It reminds me of the text I believe is something like this, out of the mouth, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I believe Solomon refers to it in one version, the issues of life. Mm -hmm. 
That just came to me or else I would have had the text. If any of you find the text and you have that around, you please share it in the chat. But the issues of life. So I'd like to know, gentlemen, have you yourselves encountered anyone that you believe has unmasked since this pandemic started? Because it would appear as though our experiences in life have unveiled another layer for us to encounter. And perhaps it could be said that the Lord has enabled us to have this experience so that we could see ourselves in a different manner. That's a twist on it, of course. But I'd like to hear from you, gentlemen. What say ye? So, McGill, any unveiling of mass that you can do? Right. So I think for a congregation as a whole, and from what I've seen so far, it's it's been a little bit for everybody. Um, because one of the common things we talked about was uh, the ability to be vulnerable vulnerable about experiences, vulnerable about emotions. So when I see that, although it's caused a lot of division through uh, politics, um, one thing, but that being our experiences is do us very close together as a church, right? Mm -hmm. um, for example, I'd say in my personal life, I've seen that I've gotten closer to some classmates because uh, during the height of the pandemic, when we were all at home at Zoom, uh, there was an opportunity for me to come back to school in person. And although it was a very, very small group of us, and I'm talking literally maybe three to seven kids in a room at a time during classes, um, we all began to get this really tight knit group of people. And, um, you know, high school is intimidating for some people. And one of the aspects of that is socially because there's so many people. And um, some people believe that there's you no know, hierarchies of popularity or whatever, but that didn't apply to us then. Um, because it was just us, right? Even we nicknamed our we nicknamed our uh, we nicknamed ourselves the Corona Crew, right? We came up with ridiculous nicknames because uh, we, it was just us, and we grew closer as a whole. Um, classmates that I have attended school with uh, for years, and I've had you know a relationship with on on the terms of acquaintance. Uh, I, I now consider some of my best friends because of it. Um, so I think overall, in terms of unmasking, we've been able to remove that kind of layer of us that. Uh, prevents us from speaking to other people in a one-on-one, -on -one, emotionally vulnerable kind of way. Hmm. Benjamin. Well, this experience has uh, brought me closer to some folks. And um, I have really gotten to know family and friends some, not all, on a more intimate level. Um, because again, yeah, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a more of a one-on-one -on -one situation, you know. Um, one of the things that I have noticed and seen is that um, even myself, I have gone closer to my God because I have gained a better understanding of my God. I have seen some frailties. I've seen some chunks, not chinks, chunks in my armor. I have been able to, I've seen some in, 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 in other indi individuals where I've been able to assist them in identifying, you know, recognizing, acknowledging, whichever word you want to use, but also understanding that the answer to our situation is God. Look beyond the mask and recognize and see and understand that God still loves us regardless of what goes down. If you are God's child, he allowed it. For what reason? Some of it, I don't have a clue. No. But not 
nothing happens to the child of God by accident. This is the type of knowledge and understanding that I have gained through this. And as far as unmasking, yes, the reality of my, our vulnerability and lack of or, or enough of our knowledge and tight relationship with God, that is what has been unmasked for me. And one of the other things too, it has, it has raised my patience level with my brothers and sisters. It has raised my patience level. And I thank God for that. Amen. Amen. I thank God for that. Amen. A devoted daughter, a loving mother, a wonderful wife, school administrator, dedicated to the talent that had been entrusted to her, a lover of music and song, and a person who embraced family to the very end. That was my cousin Sharon and so much more. I admired her from afar. One of my last moments with her in August when we were there visiting her dad, my uncle Charles, was as she was departing to go work with her students, she shared some things and then we ended with prayer. Ended with prayer. If I had to share what the pandemic has done, it has robbed us, mm. robbed us of friends and family. As I sat in the service of my uncle, it, we were robbed because she was not there to share in that with us. And yet, as Elder Benjamin has mentioned, God knew what was best. And so we have to accept that. I heard the many remarks, wonderful remarks of my cousin's dad, their dad who had passed as I sat in the service on Thursday, the impact that he made from school to church robbed far too soon. And I am sure, in fact, I am certain those of you who have joined us this afternoon, you probably know of someone You've heard of someone with an experience that has been impacted by this horrible pandemic. I'd like to think that my cousin would like to urge us to be mindful and dutiful with God's help and the prompting of his Holy Spirit to lead us to be wise as servants. Amen that we might be able to take our rightful place in the respective areas that he has asked us to serve. I by no means sit here to dictate to you what it is that should be done, but I can tell you since August, I've had a friend who had the battle for his life, Travis. Then Travis lost his brother, both mm -hmm. impacted by mm -hmm. COVID-19. Another gentleman that I admired from Kansas Avenue, Joe Abjuron, mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. That left me speechless. And then to my surprise, it came knocking on the door of my cousin who ended up being hospitalized. And then right around the same time, Patrick Fountain, the father of my cousins here in San Diego. And then it came swooping in and sweeping house in the East Coast where Elder Leggett buried his wife. Mm -hmm. And it has made its way from state to state. It is my understanding that now over 600,000 individuals have lost their lives. Mm -hmm. And now it is facing this family, our family, 
we have in a personal encounter. I remember my uncle sharing with me, El Barak, Dr. Rock, that he had three friends that had passed because of COVID-19, all of them with the name James in Huntsville, Alabama, or the greater Huntsville area. We all have our spin on it. I must admit, it's a difficult challenge. Travel just recently, and I found it hard sitting on that plane, keeping the mask on for a period of time. Even though I had a nonstop flight, I was struggling. But can I tell you that I have an intentional determination now more than ever. It has so been so sobering as I reflect on memories of all these individuals, but especially my cousin Sharon. Now, how about you? Do you have any questions for these individuals or for any of you with experiences that you might like to share? Any remarks of your thoughts on the pandemic? That's my thought. And after we take some of your thoughts, uh, we're going to share for those uh, who would like to a special prayer regarding those who are still struggling with it. I have a prayer list that has a number of individuals who are currently hospitalized and still struggling with this awful disease. We have that. And then we also have the video that uh, Elder Benjamin was, had spoken of. That will be after for those that would like to stay by. But any of you, do you have remarks, questions or comments that you'd like to share about your thoughts having to do with the mask and the experience behind the mask. Now is your time. Yes, Debbie? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I just want to share a couple of things that I've learned through this pandemic. My son um, came down with COVID. Um, and as we look over, you know, he just got it from eating with a friend mm -hmm. and at his home, that person was infected and that person infected him. Well, then we looked over my, my son's lifestyle during that time. Um, he eats very well and, you know, he likes to work out. Uh, but my, my son was spending an awful lot of time staying up at night. He had some friends and in, uh, in Japan, China, that he was communicating with. They were working on some projects. And so, you know, he wasn't getting the rest that he really, really needs. So anyway, he did come down with the virus and uh, he was doing pretty well, started out pretty well. And then I think it was on the fifth day, um, he started, you know, kind of getting brain fog and not really being able to remember because we were we were sharing with him what to do, what to take, the flu soup, make sure he takes his vitamin D, his, uh, his zinc, his, you know, um, uh, vitamin C. And he was doing that and use his diffuser, use his essential oils. And he was doing that. However, while he was thinking about doing all that, and he was alone, it was very frightening for us because he was alone and where he lived, we couldn't get to him uh, because there were you know, dogs and things like that. And so one thing that um, we, he noticed is what, you know, he couldn't remember as well to do these things. And then he told us one night, he was so focused on remembering that he realized that all of a sudden he couldn't breathe very well. And oh my goodness, that was frightening. So luckily for him, when he got to that point, he recognized it quickly. We got a, uh, we dropped a SAT monitor to him. And then my sister-in-law, who is a physician, she checked with some of her, her other, uh, you know, peers as to the treatment. And so she readily ordered him a Zitro, um, a Z pack and steroids. And so my, within 24 hours, uh, he could feel the difference, but he had these, strange symptoms like numbness down his face. He couldn't tell if he drank something, if it was hot. He didn't know it was hot until he got ready to swallow it. And then he said, oh, that was so hot. He had issues with feeling his body. He said he would take a shower and it was like he had, he couldn't really feel parts 
of, of his abdomen and, and down. And so strange neurological symptoms, but we continued with, with the regime that he was on. So thank God my son got through it. Amen. And he has no, none of those um, after effects, all those symptoms that he was experienced, but he noticed himself that he needs to rest because rest is so important along with the other natural laws of health that God has given us. And, and these things are for our good. And so I'm just encouraging everyone to um, share these, these things with our family members. And we learned that vitamin D is so essential to fighting this infection and any, any uh, you know, bacteria, virus, or whatever that comes along. There is a physician, Dr. Shield. He is local in the Inland Empire. He has a host of, of uh, videos on the importance of vitamin D. It is our fighter vitamin. It also acts as a hormone, like a steroid, and you know, a natural steroid. So it protects us against these lung infections and chronic diseases such as diabetes and cancer and autoimmune diseases. So get your vitamin D level checked, okay? When my husband got his checked, it was nine. He was dying. He was barely making it. And he had all the symptoms of low vitamin D and we didn't realize it. My brother, who's very athletic outside, you know, but he doesn't spend as much time in the sun. We're dark skin, so our skin can't uh, make it as well. We would have spent hours in the sun, but get your vitamin D level checked. And it is uh, the 25 um, D hoxy uh, uh, hydro. Let me look at the level that you want to get. Know your number. Don't let the physician or your healthcare provider say, oh, it's within range. No, to fight any disease or pandemic that we might be fighting, the levels need to be 50 to 100, very important. And the best way is, you know, we know the eight laws of health, sunshine, all that, they, they are there for our good to uh, help this body, but know your level and get, it's important. Don't just go start taking vitamin D, three, because you need to know your level so that you can get proper dosing for um, bringing it up to the optimal range. Okay, very, very important. You need a baseline to where you are and a healthcare physician, uh, practitioner to help you with the dosing to get your level in the 50 to 100 range. It is so very, very important. And, um, and you have to ask for it. This is not a lab that they will normally draw for you. You have to ask, I want my vitamin D level checked. Please do that. Because this physician said that the people who came with the worst, came into the emergency rooms, had the worst outcomes were those with uh, critically low vitamin D levels. Okay, so I just wanted to pass that information on and I'll put the, some things in the chat as far as references. Thank you very much. And thank Amen. God for this program. Thank you, Bertha, I appreciate that. May I, may I engage you just a moment longer when you say vitamin D3? What type of vitamin D3 do you recommend? There's so many different types out there. You have the little gummies and then you have the, the tablets. Is there a particular one? And then you have the uh, vitamin D drops. Is there a particular one that you recommend? That's a very good question. Um, there are a lot of good companies out there. I would just say, do your research. Um, you know, we can't believe what's on a label necessarily, but you can, you know, if a company is very transparent where they will allow you to come and see how they manufacture what they do, um, how they grow their raw materials, how they do the testing on the potency of, as well as the purity of their products. That's what I would say. Now, there are a couple of companies that I deal with and I can just share that with you after vetting these companies. So, um, because there's a mirror, you go into the market, you don't know what to buy, right? So, you know, get a trusted healthcare professional, 
help them with you that. If you wanna know what I use, I don't mind sharing the brand that I use and that I use with my family and my friends. I highly recommend it, them to use the vitamin D, but it is good to get a, a really good um, source. Okay, these are vegan vegetarian sources that I, uh, that I know of, that we have been using, our family has been using for years. Yeah. Okay, so good question. Uh, if anyone so. wants to know more, I, I use, I, there's Biotech, that's a good line. There's so many good lines out there. You just have to um, uh, ask around Young Living. That's currently what I use. I use their oil, because, I use theirs because it's oil infused with essential oils, which make it more bioavailable to our cells. But um, if anyone want to contact me, I can just help you um, in, you know, looking at some companies to research out. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Any other comments or remarks from anyone regarding behind the mask or your personal experience? Let me share with you. Hello, Danny, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I wanted to ask Doc, uh, Elder Benjamin about his research on this virus because if people are still dying from it, why are we taking this uh, shot? Why are, we, why are we getting the vaccination if they're still dying after they get it? I believe I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical person. Been married to one. I got a niece that's a doctor. I got, but I'm not a medical person. From my understanding, what I believe is happening now, individuals are being infected with the variant, which is like the original virus to the 10th power. I mean, that's the simplest way to put it. Not only that, I believe individuals also have, um, what's it called? What, what, what's the word they use? Um, underlying. Un underlying issues. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They, they, they have underlying issues. Not only that, our diet today is the average individual here in, in, in this country, they have an atrocious diet. I mean, the diet is bad. I don't know any other way to put it. And your immune system, even if you have the vaccine, what kills the virus is your immune system, not the vaccine. What the vaccine does, it allows your immune system to quickly identify the virus when it enters and take care of it. Without the vaccine, what happens is your body takes at least about two weeks to identify and, and by the time that happens, the virus has a strong hold and you can't shake it. And when you're dealing with the variant now, that's even more dangerous, stronger than the actual virus. So in my humble opinion, you know, logically speaking, it makes sense to take the vaccine, which helps your body drastically reduce the time it takes for your body to identify and take care of the virus, basically destroy it. But your immune system is what kills, you know, uh, 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 kills the virus or gets rid, rid of it, etc. So if your immune system is not strong, if you have, you're not doing what you need to do to maintain a strong immune system, you will have problems. You might have an oops which I believe is what's happening in, uh, um, you know, to those individuals. Does that make sense? 
Debbie, can I just pitch in a little bit um, to answer what the gentleman asked, why, why are we doing the vaccines or whatever? We have to remember that the vaccines are not 100% guaranteed, okay? There's one vaccine, the study I've shown is 86%. Another one I think is 95, but there is nothing that's 100% guaranteed. So we need to remember and keep that in mind. Thank you, Viola, I appreciate that. Elder Williams, Elder Tim Williams. Yeah, thank you so much, Debbie. This was a very interesting discussion and I appreciate both of your panelists there for their input into this COVID, appreciate it. Um, you asked a couple of questions and I want to delve up into to those areas quickly. Um, with me, COVID has been a blessing and a curse. The, the curse is that it's, you know, it's, it has caused so many deaths in this country. The blessing is that it, it has gotten me closer to, 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 to my savior. Amen. The thing is that we go, you know, we go through this church attendance every week and it becomes a ritual. When it was taken away and it was stopped, the whole focus changed. And um, we, my family, we have had family worship going on two years. We haven't missed the Sabbath and, and the family across the country. And I get more out of our family worship than watching any other uh, church program. And um, I, I was, it was, it was, um, and, and, and our family has, has, has enjoyed it immensely. We grew together closer as a family. And, um, and we, at least I speak for myself, I've had a closer relationship with my guy. Amen. And um, so that, so that, so that's, that's that. You asked about, you know, the church and, and is it adhering to the, to the CDC guidelines? And I, will equivocally state from my experience and those of my families who have gone back to just the waters, I would say no. I went, um, um, when we are in our church, when, when Alfonso Green uh, was, was a, had his opening sermon, I was there. And um, I was ushered to a, a seat, which was distance. And it was closer to the front and closer to the, uh, closer to the time that he was ready to preach, here comes a crowd. And um, they just wanted to be seen on television, on the thing. So they 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 got up front. You know, I was in, in, this, in the same pew I was in. So the thing, the masks were coming on, coming off, coming on, and coming off. And as I left, I saw a lot of people who weren't even wearing masks. They didn't even try to pretend to wear a mask. They weren't wearing it. And that's the first time I've been to church in a year, and I haven't been back since. <laughs> and, um, and don't pretend to go back anytime soon until there's some some sense of of, of, of responsibility and, and and things of this nature. So the thing is that I would say no, the church hasn't done what it should do as it relates to that. And um, that's from my perspective and my family members who have, have tiptoed back and seen for themselves across the country. This is not just local, but across the country. Um, the third thing, I mean, Jerry talked about it. There is a movement. Oh, before I get to that, has this been politicized? I says unequivocally, 200% yes. This has been politicized. The reason why this is this, this COVID-19 has taken the stance or the position it has is because of very poor leadership in this country. Very poor leadership. And, you know, there may be those who support the past leadership and that's fine. Everyone has the responsibility. They have the right to, to do whatever they want to do. But unequivocally, it's very poor leadership. And 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 anytime a president says up there, well, you could put Clorox or some type of drainer in your uh, in your system to deal with this, uh, you know. And people are buying this, you know. You got you got. I don't want to get into name calling, but you got a fool for a leader. Yes. So so the thing is that so. Where this is is because of leadership problems. Now, Jerry was talking about the first responders, and uh, the, very, the first responders is a very important thing. There is movement in this country um, that first responders, there's a segment of them that refuse to take 
the vaccine. While I was, you know, I, I do a lot of interviews on TV and radio. And um, one of my interviews was talking about that. And I stated unequivocally, let them go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have your choice to take, take it, and you have a choice to not take the vaccine. Well, you don't have a choice to get me sick. Mm -hmm. You don't have a choice to get other people sick. So if that's your choice, find another job. Mm -hmm. And if in law enforcement, if you take job actions, that's a termination, that's grounds for termination anyways. So the thing is that, so I, I don't, I don't get all involved in that. So that's the let them go. There was a, I looked at some numbers as we were talking. And do you know how many officers have died since this COVID hit? No, I'm not aware. 176 have Ooh. died. And there are there are those there, there are a lot of there, there's more, there's probably more than that in the hospitals as we speak. So these are your first responders. I can't speak to the firefighters. We'll let Jerry speak to that. That's his, that's his really way. But the thing is that, you know, there are there, you gotta have responsibility. You got to have, you got to have, you have to act responsibly. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, there is nothing a hundred percent. I agree with Viola, what she said, there's nothing a hundred percent. But doggone it. You put that prophylactic in your system. I, I'm, I'm, I support the vaccinations, but you put that prophylactic in your system. Um, you have a, you have a efficacy starting from 64 to 92 percent, depending upon what you take. That that's that's, a, that's more of a chance that you have if you didn't take it. So the thing is that you know I, I my position is that you take it if you're in a position that you don't want to take it and you did it with the individuals and it's important for you, so important that you want to walk from your job, leave. That's, that's, that's my position, just leave. Because you know, you, you're you affecting other people by, your, by your, your choice. Everyone has a choice, but you do not have a choice to affect other people. So that, that's, 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 that's my position and that's where I'm at. But again, uh, Debbie, this is a wonderful conversation and you're doing a great job on this. Thank you, Elder Williams, I appreciate it. I received a, and thank you for your remarks too. Thank you, Francine as well. Francine noted and observed, and here's a question from her. What are your views of vacation travel during this COVID season? Second question, what countries would you avoid if you did travel? So for our listening audience, as well as our panel, first question, what are your views of vacation travel during this COVID season? So, Elder Benjamin, I know you mentioned already you like to travel. Love to travel. And and you you seem like you had a get up and go pass mm -hmm. before COVID. I mean, all over the yep. place. And uh, so this has impacted you because you've had your feet on California soil for the longest period of time in a few years. That's correct. So how do you feel about COVID the traveling since this has occurred? Any travel that I would choose to do would be by car, if I can drive there myself. I don't think I will be attending because um, as Debbie shared, being in a plane, the small confinement and with the mass going for hours, um, uh, I, I, I don't look forward to that. So um, as a matter of choice for me, unless I really have to, I mean, I really have to, I do not plan on doing any flying, you know, traveling anywhere for vacation, any vacations I will be taking would be by car, and would be the places where I do not have to sit for long periods of time with folk I don't know who they are. I don't know where they come from. I don't know what they've been doing. No, no, that to me is playing Russian roulette. Like I said, I cannot afford a books. Not allowed. And afford a nooks. All righty, that's pretty clear. Very, very clear. Miguel, how about you? 
Yeah, I agree completely with Elder Benjamin. I think uh, now more than ever is the time to practice common sense uh, in terms of uh, where you should go and if you should avoid certain areas. You know, uh, in my eyes, if you see on the map of the world a big red spot saying danger, don't go there. <laughs> you know, on top of that, um, and I understand that it's it's very easy to uh, feel comfortable with the situation. And, you know, you might be tempted to take off the mask 10 seconds, you need to breathe or you need to step out. Uh, and that's all fine and well, but you need to realize that uh, you're taking a step towards danger when you do that, uh, whether that be family members are complete strangers, unless you've been in quarantine with them this entire time and you are with them 24 seven and you are aware of where they are. Uh, and, and again, I can't, I can't help but agree with Elder Benjamin here. Uh, don't risk it. It's not worth it. It's not worth your life. The 10 seconds of elation you're going to feel is not going to compare to uh, you die. Uh, uh, fact. The vaccine does not kill the virus. Mm -hmm. Fact. The vaccine does not prevent you from catching the virus. What the vaccine does is basically, in layman terms, give you a fighting chance to overcome or come through it. Some individuals have lost the fight. So common sense to me says, I want to go camping. I'm going to get a sheet or tent and pitch in the backyard. If I don't have a backyard, I'm going to throw it up in the living room. You know, if I have to go, if I have to go camping. If I want to go visit, pull the place up on the TV and the computer. Take a look. You understand? But climbing a plane and going there, that's a little too, no, again, I, don't, I, I, I can't be working with books. That, that's not an option. So you might find it interesting that uh, we feel so comfortable around it because you should know that Elder Benjamin and McGill and myself, we have been hanging out together for about a year and a half, actually since this COVID started. Mm -hmm. And this is not our first time being together at our home or even in the backyard. I usually see McGill about what, every two months or so. And uh, we've spent time together. I see Elder Benjamin even more often than that. And so uh, we've been around each other and praise God through all of our activities at our home. We've never had an incident of COVID. And we praise God for that. And um, God has been good and protected us. We've uh, tried to do our best with that. I am going to have somebody, if somebody would check the chat for me, please. Are there any other comments? Yeah, Debbie, That's if I can share two quick uh, uh, comments on the travel. Okay. Um, I, I had a, a elementary school classmate that traveled to Costa Rica. It took her a year to get back to the United States. I had another friend who went to uh, Ghana. It took her eight months to get back to the United States. Mm. So mm. the thing is that check the CDC travel. The, the CDC has travel. The Caribbean is, is very spotty. I would not suggest you go to the Caribbean. Um, Europe is trying to open up, but they want the American money. I would suggest that you be very careful if you do do that. But, you know, I, I love international travel, but I wouldn't leave the continental United States now to save my life. And I, I won't do any traveling other than what I have to do. Um, so my 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 uh, social traveling has has been has been shut know. down. So the thing is that check your your CDC guidelines as far as travel. Don't go to a place where you can't get out. That's the only thing I got to say. I I agree. Uh, I agree. And I've done a little bit of traveling. In fact, my husband says we move a lot, but we've been limited. I uh, appreciate your remarks, Elder Williams. But we we had two to three places we wanted to go. Postpone, 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 and got plane credits that have been uh, put to the side. Granddaughter who was supposed to wed, and uh, that was put to the side. And so you have to be wise. Traveled this year outside of the West Coast between Nevada and California. I've had my share of going in and out of Nevada, but outside of and Arizona, but outside of that, uh, 
it's been Nashville and Alabama for support of family members and, and that's been limited in terms of engagement. So I hope that answered your question, Francine. For those of you who don't know, Francine is a lover of travel from sea to shining sea. Mm. She is a lover of traveling and she uh, rightfully, I can understand she would be interested in knowing our thoughts on that. Now, I believe if, unless there are any other remarks, we're going to pause and have a word of prayer for those who are continuing to deal with the impact of COVID-19 on their families, the loss of loved ones. And um, certainly, would you please remember um, this is Ethel Bradford and Dwight Bradford, Charles Jr. Bradford, and my cousin's husband, Elder James Lewis, and her son, Jay Lewis. Would you please remember them? And then, of course, extended family members and friends and those who are feeling the loss. And then Patrick Fountain and others, the Leggett family, there are those who have been impacted. And we know, I think about the Malong Song family, Elder Malong Song, I think about Coach Roddy, I think about Jerry Warren earlier this year, Robin, I don't know if Robin mm -hmm. is on, Robin, his wife, mm -hmm. I think about uh, Joab Jerome, mm -hmm. his kids and his spouse. And I could just continue because we know we all probably know of someone. So if you don't mind, we'll pause and have a word of prayer. Elder Williams, would you mind praying for, for this matter before us? Yes, let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we take this time to come to your throne of grace. We thank you for this time that was set aside to discuss and deliberate on the issues, the issues of life. Now, then, Father, as we contemplate what is what to do and how to do it, we ask that you will be with those who are sick and afflicted. We've heard the, the requests, uh, Debbie's family, the, uh, the Bradfords, and, and those that um, have been mentioned, and there are those that have been unmentioned. We ask that you would put your hands upon those who need physical healing. As you physically heal or bring them, to, we bring their, their names to you. We ask not only as you grant the physical healing, but the, also the spiritual healing as well. Yeah. Order the steps of all of us, Heavenly Father, as we make our requests, we make our pleas. Be with the families who are going through their bereavement now. Comfort them. Comfort them and, and keep them ever focused upon you. Now we ask that you will be with all of those who are, who are present. We ask that you would order each one of our steps. We ask that you would keep us out of, out of harm's way. We thank you for the leadership that's present. We thank you for the, the leadership of Debbie from week to week. Uh, keep us ever focused on what needs to be discussed and may what's being deliberated and discussed have an impact on each one of us. Keep us out of harm's way with the COVID-19. Keep us, above all, keep us ever focused upon you. And when you come in the clouds of glory, with each person that's present, that's here, when we want to be able to look up and say, this is our Lord, we have waited, and reign with you throughout the six ages of eternity. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. Let everyone say. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us once again. It has been so nice to have this time of fellowship with you. May the Lord bless and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and grant you and yours peace. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other. For more information about this program, This Is My Story, Testimonies That Move the Soul, see us at our website. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.